in any case, um, that's the first part of John's vision. The second part of John's vision, vision is a contrast, because whereas he could count the number of the remnant of Israel, when he shifts to the second part of the vision, he says, I saw a great multitude which no one could count from every nation on earth. In other words, this isn't just limited to Israel, it's the Gentiles. So he's seeing this second group, the innumerable multitude, is from every people, tribe, nation, and tongue. And they are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they have two other marks. So the first group was distinctive because of the, the mark on the forehead that sealed them. It's chosen. This group is holding palm branches in their hands, and they're dressed in white robes. Okay, so what does that have to do with? Well, again, in the Old Testament, um, palm branches were associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. Right? So Tabernacles was a glorious feast celebrated in the fall, roughly around October, when the fall harvest came in. And it was one of the three pilgrimage festivals of the Law of Moses, where you'd go to the city of Jerusalem, offer sacrifice, and celebrate. And they would set up booths or tabernacles to live in around the city. And it was both a memorial of the Exodus, but it was also a kind of foretaste of the resurrection of the new creation. When people would recline, and they would relax, and they would rejoice and sing psalms of joy. And in the fall harvest, the fruit comes in to harvest. So, it was a feast of wine and rejoicing and, and celebration. And so, John here is taking the imagery of tabernacles, and he's kind of using it to describe the glory of heaven, to describe the glory of the resurrection, to describe the glory of salvation. But he says something else that's interesting about these uh, figures. He says they're dressed in white robes. Now, in the Old Testament, who wore white robes? Well, it was the priests. So the priests would wear white linen vestments when they would go and offer sacrifice in the temple. That was the standard garment of the priests. So these are a chosen group of priests from every nation. Now, you and I are going to, at that point, tend to think of ordained priests, like as opposed to lay people. That's not what John means here, though, because if you read earlier in his book of Revelation, chapter 4, for example, He's describing all of the saints, all of the blessed, and he says that Christ has ransomed us from every nation, washed us in his blood, and made us a kingdom of priests, right? So, the kingdom of priests refers to the entire people of Israel. It isn't just the ordained elders, but the entire people of Israel have a priestly function to offer praise and worship and sacrifice and glory to God. And so, here he's describing these Gentiles, fascinatingly enough, as if they were priests who were worshiping God, celebrating in the Feast of Tabernacles. So, John seems to be puzzled by this. You can see this, that when one of the elders in heaven before the throne of God, because that's where they are, by the way, they're around the throne of God. So, this is the heavenly kingdom, it's the heavenly throne. One of the elders around that throne turns to John and says, well, who are these clothed in white robes and where have they come from? And I love John's response. He says, sir, you know. In other words, you're in heaven, right? Why are you asking me? I'm having the vision. I, I, don't, I don't know. You tell me who they are. Is effectively, I mean, it's respectful, but that's basically what he's saying, you know. You tell me. And so the elder, the heavenly elder here, explains the vision, which is frequently what will happen. If you have a seer on earth, have a vision of heaven, the angel or some heavenly being is going to like explain the meaning of it. And he says, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, I wrote my dissertation on the Great Tribulation, so I could go on and on and on and on about this topic of the Great Tribulation, but I'll spare you, uh, or at least I'll, I'll shorten it. In an essence, the Great Tribulation was an ancient Jewish expectation you find in the prophets, that before the age of salvation would come, you would have an age of suffering. You would have a time of tribulation, and that the kingdom of God would not be ushered in without a preliminary period of tribulation and suffering. Um, and in my dissertation, I wrote about this, um, which is out of print, by the way, so no emails, please, about trying to get a copy of it. You can't get a copy of it, but, uh, but I'll tell you about it. So, in the Great Tribulation, as I wrote in the dissertation, effectively, Jesus, in his passion and death, takes upon himself the Great Tribulation. 
Now, he takes the suffering upon himself, and through his suffering, he brings in the resurrection. He brings in the kingdom. So what happens to Jesus personally, right, in himself, will in a sense happen to the church and the world at the end of time before the final resurrection of the dead. So salvation always comes through suffering is the basic point. And so here, what the elder is describing is the chosen saints who have passed through suffering to salvation, right? But he uses this fascinating image of having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, if you've ever done laundry with a white garment, you'll know that if you get red on a white garment, that's, it's not going to come out easily, right? So if you want to make a white garment clean, you don't wash it in blood, right? So there's a paradox here. They made their robes white by washing them in the blood of the Lamb. So um, the paradox here actually appears, it once again, appears to reflect Jewish context because the priests would go into the temple wearing white linen and then they'd sacrifice lambs. And what do you think that white linen would look like when they were done sacrificing, right? It'd be stained with the blood of the lamb. So John is using this image here basically to describe the church, to describe Christians. And he seems to be emphasizing martyrs, but in effect, he's also talking about everyone. Because if, in essence, what happens to us when we are baptized? What happens to Christians when they're baptized? They're marked on the forehead, right? The sign of the cross. But they also, since ancient times, they've worn a white garment to symbolize purification from sin through the water of baptism and the blood of Christ. So it's the blood of Christ that washes, cleanses this person from sin, and makes them white ironically, through the blood of the Lamb. So, in essence here, John is having a vision of the church taken from Israel and the Gentile and from all who have been washed and made clean through the blood of Christ, right? who have made, been made holy through the blood of Christ, who have been made a kingdom of priests through the water of baptism and the blood of Jesus. So, the reason the church chooses this passage, right, for All Saints Day is because it is John's vision of the plenitude of the saved, the full number of the saved, both Israel and the Gentiles, in the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's describing.